Hi, uh, today I'd like to share with you about Israel's Independence Day and what we as Christians can learn from what Israel has gone through. So, uh, Israel, um, it could be said, is 3,000 years old, but 72 years young, now in 2020. Uh, and uh, it's a cause of celebration, and every year there's giant celebrations in Israel with fireworks, with parties, and so on. But in amidst all this celebration, it's important to remember that it came at a price. Behind every testament of victory, there are stories of great sacrifice and also of courage. The high cost that Israel paid for its independence is celebrated and remembered every year the day before Independence Day on Fallen Soldiers Remembrance Day. And this is a picture from this year, 2020, as people are remembering the, the victims and those who have fallen uh, during this time of coronavirus, remembering back to what happened in Israel's wars. Since its founding, Israel has fought eight wars faced two Palestinian intifadas and many, many waves of terrorism. 23,816 soldiers or police have been killed in defending the state of Israel. That's a heavy toll for any nation and especially for one the size of Israel. There's also been over 4,000 terror victims uh, in this whole conflict. Is God really in this? A question some Christians will ask is, if God really was in the rebirth of Israel, it would not have involved so much war, would it? Well, that's one way of looking at it, but being a Christian isn't a walk in the park either. You know, you and I, we face opposition as well, as believers, and we have an enemy to contend with. Being a Christian is not... Uh, a, uh, a bed of roses. It's not a, a time where it's just heaven on earth. In fact, we are facing an ongoing battle. If it's not one area, it's another area, and we have an enemy to contend with. And this is the same regarding Israel. And so the fact that there is contest and a fight and a battle over the land of Israel does not mean that God is not in it. In fact, it could well be a sign of the opposite, a sign that God is indeed in what is happening in Israel, is the fact that there is such a fight over this land, such a fight over this destiny. Ephesians, Ephesians 6 reminds us as believers to take up the whole arm of God. In other words, we are in a battle, we are in a fight, and so is Israel. Why should we study Israel's modern history? Uh, I've been studying the Bible uh, from childhood, growing up in a Christian home, and I love reading the stories of David and Goliath and, and all the stories of ancient Israel. But as I've grown up, I've begun to study Israel's modern history, and I've learned a lot from it, and I've found spiritual applications from it. Is that valid scripturally? Well, in 1 Corinthians 10, it says that the things that happened to Israel is an example or a type for us as believers, and are written for our admonition. In other words, they are for our learning. And so here, Paul is, of course, referring back to ancient Israel's history, and that we can learn lessons from what happened with Israel, from their highs, from their lows, from their failures, from their successes. And I believe the same applies today. The God of Israel is not dead. He is still working in his people. And there's still things we can learn from their story and from what is happening to them today. God has not forgotten his people, but neither are his people perfect. And as we study Israel's history today, so much of what is happening today can connect back to the scriptures, back to what is prophesied and foretold but can also serve as lessons for us as we face an enemy and a foe who is out to hinder us in our faith. So I believe that we are not only to study Israel's past history, but also will find value in studying the history and the story from today. So what can we learn from Israel's Independence Day, in particular from its founding in 1948, which this Independence Day is all about? You see, the Jewish people, as they remember Independence Day, they have gradually begun to put it on a similar scale to the, the remembrance of um, the Exodus, the remembrance of Purim and the story of Haman. 
What I mean by this is that when they remember the Exodus, they'll, re they'll read a certain scripture portion, they'll say certain prayers, and they'll thank God for what happened. They do the same as they remember the Purim and the story of Esther and Haman. And today they've developed uh, a, a scripture portion, they've developed prayers to, to read and to meditate on on Israel's Independence Day, to consider what God did in these days, right now, and also to give him thanks on a similar way as they've done for what he has done in the past. Now on the 29th of November 1947, the UN voted to approve a partition plan and Israel would become a state. There were celebrations in the streets of Israel. There were celebrations in the streets as the Jews poured out of their buildings, started dancing spontaneously. It was the beginning of an end of a 1900 year exile. It was something the people had longed for for so long. As they had been through centuries of persecution in the Western world, in Russia, in the Middle East, in the Arab world, as they had been downtrodden and persecuted and had to flee from place to place to place, the question on their hearts again and again is, when will we be able to return to the land of our forefathers? When will we be able to return to Jerusalem? And so this vote marked the beginning and a change in the air and the people of Israel celebrated what God was doing. There was dancing in the streets and everyone was rejoicing except their leader David Ben-Gurion who was to become the first Prime Minister of Israel because he knew what this meant. He knew it meant there would be war coming. He knew that it meant there would be a fight over the nation of Israel and he knew there would be a heavy price to pay. And he wasn't sure that the people were ready to pay the price. In the lead up to Britain withdrawing the following year in 1948, there was an arms embargo on the Jews. They were unable to get the heavy weaponry that they needed. Meanwhile, the British were training and equipping the Arabs, uh, in particular the Jordanian army. In fact, a high percentage of the officers in the Jordanian army were British. So while the Arabs were being trained, were being equipped, were getting the best technology of the day, the Jews were struggling to smuggle in simple handguns and grenades. As there was a movement to uh, declare Israel's independence, the US Secretary of State Marshall warned uh, Israel's leaders saying do not declare independence and said if you do this you will firstly you'll not stand a chance against the enemy's invading armies from the Arab nations the five armies that will come your way but secondly you will not have our help you'll be standing on your own his statement uh, caused fear in the the top officials in uh, the emerging Jewish government as they were wondering whether or not to declare independence at this time. And so they, they spoke about it, they talked about it, they debated about it, and finally they came to a decision saying, we are going to go ahead. And so on the 14th of May, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared independence for the State of Israel, knowing full well that this would lead to war. And his fear, as I mentioned before, was that the people might give up at the sight of war. And, of course, soon the bombs began to fall. On the very next day, the war began. Jerusalem under fire. We've got a picture here of you know, Arabs being transported to the front lines. And by July, 70% of Israel was occupied by Arab armies. Jewish Jerusalem found itself under constant fire. So the, the New Jerusalem, as it's called, was under constant fire and bombardment. It was, in fact, uh, under an embargo, so they could not get food in. The streets were being cut. The transport routes were cut by the Arabs. And so the food rations went down to Japanese concentration camp level. So just one level above German concentration camp level was the food rations for every person living in Jerusalem in the Jewish part because they could not get hold of the food they needed. It was a desperate time. It was a hard time for everyone living in the city, defending Jerusalem. 
Israel had an ill-equipped uh, army and they were running low on manpower. However, they were having immigrants coming into the nation and they had a few boatloads of Holocaust survivors who had spent some time uh, in refugee camps of Europe who now came to Israel. And a group of them were gathered together uh, and they all spoke different languages. No one understood anything. And the commander got up and spoke to them, telling them what their task was. And no one understood what he was saying. So it took him a good 15 minutes to be able to get it translated to every language of everyone who was there. But his message to them was this. You are going to go and liberate Jerusalem. And when he said these words and they finally understood it, a cheer arose from his Holocaust survivors, saying, Yes, we are going to Jerusalem. And so these Holocaust survivors were quickly uh, equipped with weapons and they were sent to a key crossroad called Latrun. They were sent to fight an Arab stronghold that was there. And this fight became the bloodiest battle of 1948. As the ill-equipped Israeli army came, they had not had the time to do the surveillance, the reconnaissance work ahead of time, and they walked straight into an Arab trap. And so many of these people, so many of these Holocaust survivors, lost their lives that day. And to this day, Latrun is remembered in Israel's history as a strategic battle that was lost, and a huge sacrifice given to liberate Jerusalem. In uh, Jerusalem's old city, things were extra desperate. There were 1,700 Jews, mainly elderly women and children, who were surrounded and cut off. They had a small contingent of fighters protecting them, and they were hopelessly outnumbered. One of the last reinforcements to enter the old city and the Jewish quarter on the 7th of May was a 23-year-old, Esther Kallengold. She arrived as a teacher. But quite quickly, uh, she got involved uh, in the fighting, running supplies between trapped fighters. She was, in fact, an undercover fighter, uh, but it wasn't her main skill. And so she was running supplies between the trapped fighters. But on the 26th of May, she was mortally wounded and passed away three days later. And I want to read to you her letter to her parents that she wrote as she was lying on her deathbed, just to give you a sense of the sacrifice and the price that she paid and was willing to pay. And so you can have a look at her heart and understand her in her own words. She writes on May 23rd, Dear Mummy, Daddy and everyone, If you get this at all, it will be, I suppose, typical of all my hurried, messy letters. I am writing it to beg of you that whatever might have happened to me, you will make the effort to take it in the spirit that I want and to understand that for myself I have no regrets. We have had a bitter fight. I have tasted of hell, but it has been worthwhile because I am convinced that the end will see a Jewish state and a realization of all our longings. I will only be one of many who fell in sacrifice. And I want you to remember that we were soldiers and we had the greatest and noblest cause to fight for. God is with us, I know, in his own holy city, and I am proud and ready to pay the price. I am thinking of you all, every single one of you in the family, and am full of pleasure at the thought that you will one day, very soon I hope, come and enjoy the fruits of that for which we are fighting. Much, much love, and remember me only in happiness. Shalom and Lehitraot, your loving Esther. And so these became her final words as she described the sacrifice and the price that they had to pay to defend the holy city, the, the, the price they had to be willing to pay for this nation of Israel. I believe God had promised them this land. It's the promised land, yet they had to be willing to fight and willing to lay down their lives for the sake of this land and for the sake of freedom for their, their fellow, fellow Jews. In the midst of all this, there were also miracles that happened. So there was sacrifice. There were many who laid down their lives. But there's also things that happened which just spoke to the Jewish people and revealed to them that God was with them, even in the midst of all this. As Jerusalem was under siege and food was desperately short, there was an unexpected rainfall, which led to an unusual crop of a nutritious weed called mallow. We've got pictures of mallow here on the right. And down below, we've got a picture of mallow soup, 
which people in Israel eat to this day on Independence Day, as they remember the food that was provided to them from above. Because this nutritious weed, it has all parts of it are edible, and it's surprisingly filling, and it's rich in iron, calcium, and even vitamin C. Perfect for a city under siege. And so as the people of Jerusalem saw this rainfall, saw the weed popping up everywhere, they said to themselves, Wow, God is with us again. God is with us in the land. And I want to talk about the Israeli Air Force and the miracle of the Israeli Air Force. The Egyptian army uh, were invading and advancing without opposition from the south. They were now only 30 kilometers from Tel Aviv with nothing to stop them. There were 6,000 troops on their way. Now Israel had only four Messerschmitt planes to stop them. So these are German-built planes that Israel had managed to acquire, and this was what they needed and the only thing they had to stop all these troops from invading Tel Aviv. A pilot, Lou Leonard, who was one of the, the pilots of these craft, describes it this way. This plane was the worst piece of crap I've ever flown. It was not even an airplane. It was put together by the Czechs from mismatched parts left behind by the Nazis. The airframe was that of an ME-109, but the propeller and engine came out of a Henkel bomber. You can't make a plane that way. But it was all we could get, so we took it. And he describes his first flight with the plane and how he almost crash-landed in the sea. That's how bad this plane was. So they were relying on four of these planes that they now had taken the Nazi symbols off and put Jewish stars of David on, and this was going to protect them from the invading army from Egypt. So the four pilots alone faced 6,000 Egyptian troops, consisting of seven infantry battalions, 600 vehicles and formidable anti-aircraft weapons. And this is what they say, we attack. And the guns began to malfunction, the bomb releases balked, and I uh, looked right and left and could see no one. Anti-aircraft fire is ferocious. 6,000 Egyptians are putting up everything they've got. I, that's Lou Leonard writing, managed to put 170k bomb onto concentration of trucks and troops in the town square of Ishtud. Modi and Eze, two other pilots, do what they can. It's a mess. We straggle back, having inflicted minimal damage. Now what good could this possibly do? Well, the next day we found out. As Israeli intelligence intercepted this dispatch from the brigade commander to Cairo, the Egyptian brigade said, We were heavily attacked by enemy aircraft, and we are scattering. And in fact, Israel and Tel Aviv was therefore saved, and so was the nation, was protected. And meanwhile, of course, Israel built up their troops again well to counterattack, and they began to do well. But just at that moment, all that stood between Israel and oblivion were these four planes. Be of good courage. There's a, a Jewish debate that uh, was framing the whole story of Israel being recreated as a nation. The debate was, do we wait for the Messiah to establish Israel, or do we do everything we can and rely on him for the rest? And so some Orthodox communities to this day believe that they should not have acted, should have waited completely for the Messiah to come, and anything else is not, not right and not good. But the conviction that came to many Jewish people was that they should do everything they could in their might and trust God to do the rest. That God would open up the door, that God would make the impossible possible, but that God was waiting for them to stretch out their hand and do what they could do. I believe this relates to us as believers. God has given us so many promises in the scriptures. It says that he has given us precious promises, specific promises. He has given us words that are for our lives, for our family, for our nation, for our city. But God is not calling us to passively sit back and watch. If you remember the story of Daniel, when the prophecy had, was given from Jeremiah that the exile would last for 70 years, and Daniel realized time was up, he began to pray. He was not a passive observer. He began to pray. And so you and I have got promises in our lives. We're not called to be passive observers. We're called to interact, to pray, to intercede, and to fight spiritually to see those promises come to pass. One key element that speaks to me from the story of Israel's independence 
uh, is that it relates back to the story of Joshua and Caleb and the, the 12 spies. They went into the land. They were expecting this wonderful promised land, but there was a surprise. And the surprise was that there's giants in the land. There were giants and there were huge fortifications and ten of the spies began to shake in their boots. They got intimidated by what they saw and they lost sight of the promise of God. But two of them had a different spirit and when they saw the challenges, they said, if God is with us, we are well able to overcome. And I've found that in our Christian life, as we begin to step out and follow God, as we begin to follow His call in our lives, you will encounter giants. And giants will come against you. Things you did not expect will show up. And they'll be harder and more difficult to deal with than you could ever expect. And the temptation could be then to, to run back to Egypt, to give up, to let go of the promise, to let go of it. It's too hard. We have an enemy, and that enemy is relentless. But we need not to be surprised by the fact that there is opposition. We have someone who is trying to hinder us every step of the way. But God is faithful and he will work with us to perform his word. So we are called to trust in him. We are called to trust in him and be prepared for the fight and the battle that is ahead. Christian life requires courage and commitment. As I am growing in my own life and things are happening and I've got married, got two kids... Uh, the pressure is on and the pressure is increasing and it's getting more and more challenging. I could give up, I could surrender, but God is calling me to fight and keep on fighting and to stand on his word and to hold very fast and very close to him in this time. And it takes courage when our feelings do not line up, when the circumstances are screaming at us saying, it's impossible, you can't do it, it is too hard. And that is the very time when we need to hold on to the word of God. We need to hold on to the promise. The Jewish people had a promise that one day they would be regathered to the land. And that promise motivated their annual prayer saying next year in Jerusalem. May it be next year in Jerusalem. It became a hope before their eyes. And sometimes you and I are in a situation where we have to wait for a while for a promise from God to come to pass. But during that waiting time, keep the promise before your eyes. Don't let the enemy distract you from it, take you away from it. Keep reminding yourself of what God has said. Faith takes courage. And as we hold firm, as we hold firm to his word, I know that God will surely do his part. So whatever fight you're facing today, I want to encourage you, with this key verse from Joshua 1 9, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So, Lord, I thank you for everyone who's listening today, and I pray for your blessing on them, Lord, and in the challenges they're facing in their personal lives. Lord, I speak a new level of confidence and courage where things might have wearied them down, where it's felt heavy burden to, to carry on an ongoing basis, where it's been discouraging one way or another. Lord, I speak new courage and new comfort to those who are listening, Lord, to rise up in the Spirit, Lord, to have a different spirit like Joshua and Caleb, who said, if God is with us, we are well able. And I thank you for the promised land you have for every one of us. And I thank you, Lord, that you are with us to overcome those giants. And so we renounce, Lord, and we repent, Lord, of the times we've been intimidated by the enemy, where we've held back because he's come against us, because he's spoken his lies, because he's intimidated us with what he's saying lord we repent where we've been afraid and lord we we lift our eyes to you and we receive that courage from you afresh and we remind ourselves of your promises and we remind you of your promises lord and we say lord we are willing to step out we're willing to do everything you call us to do and we trust and we depend on you to work with us so that the promise can come to pass so that we too can inherit the promised land amen